Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this Getting to the Point program presented by the Kennedy Institute. I'm Lauren Scribby, Director of Programs and Government Relations. While our building is closed to the public, we remain committed to civic engagement and education, and we're glad to welcome you now live, as well as those who will log on later to enjoy this program. We at the Kennedy Institute are most excited about hosting this conversation because we are dedicating much of our 2020 programming, digital resources, and online experiences to examining elections, voting, and citizen participation in the democratic process. This conversation is the perfect place to start as registered voters in Massachusetts begin to receive mail-in ballot applications. This afternoon, we are thrilled to welcome Massachusetts State Senator Barry Feingold and Massachusetts State Representative John Lawn, chairs of the Joint Committee on Election Laws. Chairman Feingold was elected in 2018 to represent the 2nd Essex and Middlesex District. That includes all of Andover, Dracut, Lawrence, and Tewksbury, a seat he previously held from 2011 to 2015. Chairman Lawn was elected in 2011 to represent the 10th Middlesex District that includes parts of Watertown, Waltham, and Newton. Moderating the conversation today is Pam Wilmot, a well-known champion of democracy in the Commonwealth. As Executive Director of Common Cause Massachusetts, Pam leads democracy reform efforts statewide. Pam has been an advocate for government reform and consumer and environmental issues for over 20 years. In her role at Common Cause, she was instrumental in developing and advocating for the successful passage of the recent election reform law. If you have any questions that you would like to submit for the panel during this program, please feel free to do so via programs at emkinstitute.org. With that, I'll hand it over to Pam to get the conversation started. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you, uh, Representative Lawn and Senator Feingold for joining this discussion. Um, we are in a unique moment. COVID-19 has changed everything for us, for businesses, and also for election laws. We've seen across the country as uh, cities and states and communities have scrambled to protect the right to vote. And we've seen infringements of uh, that, that basic right over and over again. We've seen people not receive absentee ballots. We've seen a huge increase in absentee balloting or vote by mail, depending on how you want to call it. We have seen uh, polls close so that a city may only have one single polling place. Um, I mean, people in line for, uh, for hours and hours. Uh, and we've seen spikes in COVID-19 because of uh, people exercising their constitutional right. Stepping into that breach has been uh, the Massachusetts legislature for our voters here in Massachusetts. And it has been my privilege to work with both Chairman Lawn and Chairman Feingold uh, on the legislation we'll be discussing today. We'll have a slightly broader conversation, I think, as we move forward. Um, but uh, it has also been my privilege to work with them in the past, particularly Senator Feingold, who was chair of the Election Laws Committee also in 2014, when Massachusetts passed another big uh, election reform that included early voting for the first time, online voter registration, uh, an update on uh, the inactive voting procedures, as well as auditing of election results. That was a big step forward for our state, and this new bill is a big step forward as well. Um, I look forward to this conversation. Uh, please do email if you have questions. We'll try to incorporate them into the discussion. I can't promise that um, we'll be able to do that, but we will certainly try. Um, so uh, thank you both uh, legislators for joining us. And let me just start um, with a similar general question that I'd like you both to answer is why did you particularly think and, and your colleagues agree with you that it was important to update the voting laws this year? 
All right, Judge, there you go. So uh, first of all, um, I want to thank the, the Kennedy Institute for Lauren for having us here. It's great to do this. And Pam, thank you for, you know, moderating and following all your advocacy. We work with a lot of different people that are advocates. Pam is as, as good as they come because she gets the inside game, she gets the outside game. And um, one of the reasons why this passed is because of people like Pam. Um, the other main reason why it passed is having a co-chair like John Lawn, who was just uh, tireless, that just did um, so many, so much work and had so many great ideas. Um, I almost wanted to name the bill the Lawn Bill, but uh, I don't think it uh, went too far, but um, really was great. And I think that's the most important thing is partnership. But to, to your point, uh, your question on point is that, um, you know, March 12th was a normal day and, you know, we we're thinking about everything, but, you know, changing the upcoming elections. We were thinking about ranked choice. We were thinking about same day and all of a sudden the pandemic hit. And all of a sudden we realized that we have to think about this upcoming election different. Um, and, and the hard part is that people think about it differently. There's some people that are eagerly that want to go to vote on the election day that are not concerned at all. Um, there's some people that, you know, are okay to do vote in person, but they don't want the crowds. And there are some people that do not want to leave their house. So we had to come up with a plan that frankly could satisfy all of that. Um, in a time where, you know, as I tell people, every week's like a, every day's like a week, every week's like a month and every month's like a year. Um, and we don't know what's going to be in, in front of us in, in a month from now. And, you know, three months from now seems like, like three years from now. So who knows? So that's why, um, you know, when R R Chairman Lon and myself were playing this out, we, we tried to think, okay, what are different scenarios? And that's why we decided to do what we did. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Long. Thank you, Pam. And um, I'm proud to be here today with everyone. And um, I just want to thank both Pam uh, for her work and help. Um, boy, she was someone that I know Barry and I spoke to several times a day for, for many, many weeks uh, as we tried to pull together um, a lot of different bills. Um, and as Senator Feingold, um, it was just a, an incredible partner in this. Um, we got along uh, well with both the goal of, of and our staffs as well. I mean, our, our credit to our staffs. So we were lucky that we had such a dedicated staff who we came into the state house. And I know you asked me earlier where I am. This is kind of a little bunker in the house we had. We broke down every bill um, and spread it out so we could try to pick, you know, the best ideas out of every bill. Not I had filed a bill with the representative Moran in the House um, that was, you know, many you know was was to you know send ballots to everybody in the general election was something that we realized after speaking to our colleagues, speaking to members of the committee, um, that it, it was not something that was going to be um, go over well, and we needed to to work back from there into a bill that was going to have consensus and that people could support. But most importantly, give every voter in Massachusetts uh, an option to vote how they feel safely. And I think at the end, the bill did that. And I think we got almost unanimous support in both branches. Um, and it was something that I think we talked about many times during the process was the last thing we need is another divisive issue. Um, we've got so many divisive issues going on. Uh, in this country and they just keep happening, but uh, we needed to, to come together and make sure that we could all uh, support a bill that did give every voter in Massachusetts a voice. And I think at the end, we were able to do that. So um, it was a credit to, to both Pam, our staffs and Senator Feingold. I can't thank enough for, for his support um, for, you know, just dedication of trying to get this bill right and nothing's perfect ever, but um, I think at the end, it was a very good bill. And what we had to do also, and as we know what's going on now, the rest of the country is, we don't know what's gonna happen. Um, for September 1st, when we started this bill, you know, uh, back in May, working on it, uh, we don't know what, things don't look good for, for November. Um, things are getting worse in this country. And we needed to plan ahead of time to give as many options as we can to voters in Massachusetts. So I, I you know, I, I think we all should um, 
be proud of that. So I think the, the, those options are there, and um, we, sh you know, we do know it's going to be a challenge. It's not perfect, but it, it does provide us a lot of safe options for voters uh, this this fall. So um, thank you, John. Before we go to what's in the bill, and I think we should go through that for the people that are listening. Let's just talk a just second about the process of a bill becoming a law and um, Representative Lawn, if you wouldn't mind saying uh, a little bit about um, how that works, what the committee does and just the process and then maybe Senator Feingold, you can add anything or add in how it's different now with COVID-19. Sure, so, <clears throat> You know, once COVID-19 hit, we realized, as most of the country, that we, we need to redo and rethink how our elections are going to be held. Um, we think we saw early on New York, which was first hit very hard. Um, we were watching those states and seeing what people were doing. There was many states that were looking at ballot applications, uh, ascending ballots. Some look at applications, and I think a lot of states got frozen on not knowing, not knowing what to do. Um, so when we, the legislature, there was, um, the, we had held a hearing that lasted for about four hours on several bills that were si uh, filed, um, probably seven or eight bills between the House and Senate that were filed. Uh, when those bills were filed, we held a hearing. Uh, we listened to the testimony. We listened to the challenges that maybe we hadn't thought of. Um, and that's the process of, of filing bills, hearing testimony, understanding um, the perspectives of the clerks, of, of the Secretary of State, um, all these municipalities that have different challenges in different areas of the state. So that process, you know, we go through the hearings. We, we then, uh, Senator Feingold and I uh, worked with, with you, Pam, and as you know, others to now then pull uh, together pieces of the, that legislation that was filed. It was not one bill that was, you know, that was became the, that was filed originally that became the bill. It was a lot of different pieces to it. So, and different pieces of, of other legislation that was good ideas. So we tried to pull the best ideas together, the ones that would work. So we had that process and then um, Senator Feingold and I worked with our staff and our colleagues. And I, I think I spoke to every house member in the committee. I, uh, three or four times, Democrat and Republican, making sure that I, we heard their voices. I know Senator Feingold did that on the Senate side. We got their input, what they were comfortable with, what they weren't comfortable with, and try to come up with the bill. So then, you know, we present that um, to, you know, the House um, and the Senate. And then uh, there was a few small differences that in the legislation that we were able to work out in the conference committee pretty quickly. Um, certainly time was of the essence in this bill. There was not a lot of time to waste um, because this is, you know, for the Secretary of State to, to carry out the legislation, we needed to get that done and get it to the governor as soon as possible. So um, that was pretty much the process. I'm not sure if I left anything out. I'm sure I have, but Senator Feingold can pipe in. Yeah, you know, I, th I, think, I think it's interesting that there were definitely some things that were easier to do during during COVID and some things that were harder. What was harder is you didn't have as much of that face-to-face -face kind of understanding what's how people are feeling about it. Like, you know, in when you pass le legislation or you do policy, it's the art of trying to understand what people are thinking to get them on board. So I missed that kind of one-on-one, -on -one. but on the flip side, Instead of having these longer meetings where you have to schedule a half hour, you have to spend 10 or 15 minutes talking about the weather, their kids and all of their stuff. I set up phone calls with a lot of colleagues. They last maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And I was able to get through a lot of members a lot quicker than normally that we would do. And at the same time, the hearing wasn't the same, but I felt like doing a Zoom hearing, we were able to get people in and out a lot quicker. Um, and we actually, I felt, you know, er, almost everybody that wanted to testify was able to testify. And I, and I felt like there were really good questions that were asked. So I really didn't feel that we left a lot by not having an in-person hearing, but there were definitely a lot of efficiency. When the actual bill 
came to the floor. A couple of times we had some amendments that, you know, somebody would call a roll call on where not everyone was, for lack of a better expression, totally tuned in, understanding what's going on. So that was a little harder. Like it's when you're in a, you're in a chamber like we are, and there's only 40 of us in the Senate, it's so much easier when we're in session to kind of work together, talk about things where, when, where, where most of us are calling in and aren't, um, aren't kind of together, it, it's definitely harder to, you know, kind of get things done like that. But overall, the bill got done, so it worked out pretty well. It did. Um, so one of you, it would be really great to hear from both of you just maybe um, to cover the key provisions of the bill. Um, however you want to start, somebody might want to take the uh, vote by mail, somebody might want to take in person, whatever, whatever you want to do. It's fine with me, but let's get those on the table. Well, um, I'll start out by just saying, for the first time in the history of Massachusetts, we are doing uh, in-person voting in a state primary. Um, we are doing seven days, which is, includes uh, two weekend days, Saturday and Sunday before the election. Um, that's something that has never been done before. Uh, that, uh, and we also are obviously having polls, but the, the one of the, um, from the original bill I filed, I had um, requested two weeks of in-person early voting in the primary. And this is how things change. And, you know, after listening to the clerks association, the towns and city clerks association, and really realizing the amount of stress they're gonna be under, um, processing mail, uh, running a running in-person voting at town hall clerk's office essentially are running an election every day leading up to an election that they have to prepare for like this year will be an enormous challenge so we did cut that back um, that was something that we realized after listening uh, to the clerks it was important to have less um, early in-person voting during the Primary, we also did in the general election, uh, 14 days, including two weekends of in-person voting uh, and also having the polls open for our uh, general election. And I, and I would just echo that, um, you know, the, the one thing that we both understand is that how hard this is gonna be for our clerk. So, you know, Secretary Galvin, we think, we hope, better, um, we'll be sending out applications to um, vote by mail. Many of these will be going out very soon. So in theory, call it August 1st, the clerks are gonna start sending out ballots. So they're gonna do that probably all of August, then have an election. We're gonna have, we have a couple of days after the election to still count votes. And as soon as that's basically over, call it maybe a week or two, the next batch of applications go out for vote by mail for the general. So our clerks literally will be busy for all of August, all of September, all of October, and then days leading up to the election. So as John was saying, we wanted to make it easier for them to, be, to start processing ballots. We wanted them to, if they wanna get rid of the second checkout table, um, they can do that. And if they need extra help, they can go from the outside, not their town, to recruit people to be poll workers. So let's hypothetically say that you have a college in your town and there's some younger people that want to be involved, some college students. In the past, that would have been difficult to do, but now you can actually recruit people in to be your poll workers. So um, we are trying, we're doing everything we can to help our clerks. But, um, you know, there was a poll that came out that said, you know, call it 70% of people are going to vote in person, but 30% are still going to vote by mail. That is a huge number. That is a massive number. So I cannot under this, I cannot discount how hard it's going to be for our clerks to get this done. And it is something that I think they will get done. I think they, they, they know in advance what it's going to take, but uh, it, it's going to be a challenge this election, election season. And, and, you know, when you have, a presidential year, everyone comes out. That's right. I mean, the turnout in the 
presidential general is usually 75 percent. Um, uh, it typically is lower in a, a primary, but who knows this year? Um, so you talked about um, having expanded early voting for both the primary and the general, um, having ballot applications sent to people twice, some things that the bill did to make it easier for uh, recruitment of poll workers um, and also uh, being able to process ballots kind of uh, in a central way, which will be easier for the clerks. Are there anything else in the bill that you know you feel are important that people should know about or um, that can you also say if there's yeah, I would just, you know, one thing I don't think we mentioned in more in depth is, is the portal, um, something that Common Cause and so many other groups push for that by, at least by the general, we will have a portal for people to register to vote by mail online. Um, we should be able to do, you know, we should have this already, but we don't, but this is something that we are going to get. Uh, something that I know the House very much was, was pushing for as well. Um, so th this is going to be a good thing that, you know, we have to be in the, in, the, in, the, in the 21st century, you know, last go around, as Pam mentioned, 2014, we finally got a portal to register to vote online. So, um, you know, you, you, can, you can do your banking online, you can do your shopping online, like you should be able to register to vote, you should be able to register um, to vote by mail online, and that's, you know, the direction we're going. So let me just, just based on what you said, Senator, I wanna just read something that came in as an audience question. Uh, and I think it, uh, it kind of encapsulates the dilemma that our, a lot of our election officials said um, are, are feeling now. Um, the, the questioner said, we generally have 100 absentee ballots. For our local elections in June, we had 300. For our little a town, that was an extraordinary amount. So the prospect of 11,000 uh, mail applications or you know, some high percentage of that is absolutely overwhelming and I can't begin to fathom how we might manage that. Um, do you have any advice or how we might be able to, to actually do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I, think, I think that is something that we are trying to get the message out right now that you know, the way the law works is that unfunded mandates we have to cover, but there is no question that, you know, all the election departments are going to have to beef up their staff. There's no ifs and buts about it. Um, we, you know, we, we're going to have, I spoke to one of my clerks, they're going to have a rolling application. They get the application, ballots go out and that, you know, and then ballots come back and then you can be processing stuff. So, Basically, what, what Chairman Law was saying is that every day is an election and that every single day you're going to be processing ballots and getting stuff out. So, you, you know, the, that amount of staff that you have on election day helping you out, you might need close to that on a daily basis. Now, you probably don't need as many people, but you're going to need people. And that is stuff that, you know, cities and towns should start planning for now. Now, I don't think you're going to need that many people in the primary, but in October, 100% that it's going to need um, that many people. And there's just no easy way around this. So, Anything to add on that, Representative? Or? No, I, I think you mentioned briefly about the checkout polls that we allow cities and towns for the clerks to eliminate checkout polls, which will certainly help on election day. And as you mentioned earlier, too, the, the two elections from September to November are very different turnouts. Um, so, you know, hopefully... Uh, we will learn something from our September uh, lower turnout election that we can help uh, prepare more for November. But, um, you know, I know there's certain uh, guesstimates on what turnout will be. Um, typically, the uh, state primary in a year like this is a low turnout. I think we have probably more people engaged. Certainly the Ed Markey, Joe Kennedy race will drive a lot of turnout. Um, but you know, what that number is, is that 30%, maybe on the high end, I believe, when I spoke to their campaigns, that, that's where they kind of thought 30, 35% was the high end to 20%. What do you think, Pam? I see you shaking your head. In-person turnout or vote by mail? I think vote by mail is a lot higher than people no, are- No, I mean total turnout, total turnout. Oh, total turnout, yes. Total turnout. Yeah, 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 that's high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, you know, so, 
you know, I think those numbers for whether it's vote by mail, in person, obviously we wanted to give these options and we do need to do a good job of educating the public and let, you know, trying to get them to vote early by mail, having them vote in person early um, so that we don't have big long lines at, at election day. But I think, as we know, the September election will not be a high turnout, which should be manageable, hopefully. Yeah, and I, and I, think, I think to Chairman Lon's point is we're going to learn a lot these next 30 days and we'll have to make, probably make some, you know, potential change. I, I think the biggest thing is that people have to understand if they get the application in the mail, they don't have to do anything with it. And they don't have to vote by mail, but it's something that is there for them if they choose to do that. So um, I think people um, will learn a lot in this election the first time around, so. Yeah, I, I would just put down a, a couple of other things that I think are gonna make it easier for clerks to manage this volume of, of uh, mail, which is gonna be unprecedented. There's no question about it. One is the secretary is including um, barcodes and uh, pre-filled information in the application so those can be scanned rather than entered by our election officials. That will definitely help things along. Um, once the online portal goes up, that means less paper for the officials to deal with. So the online portal is a big um, part of the legislation to help reduce clerks' um, output. Um, and uh, in addition to, you know, really needing those high speed scanners and other kinds of equipment. Um, so there was a question about how uh, the, this is another audience question, how would equipment be paid for? So the secretary has um, HAVA money, which is Help America Vote Act. Uh, and that's how a lot of the stuff can be reimbursed. Um, you know, we also got five, um, million dollars to reimburse the um, local cities and towns for um, elections as well. So there will be money, um, and, but we understand this is going to be expensive. So there's, you know, it's, they, they will be funding for that. So um, one thing, um, anything else to add to that representative or are you good? Good. No, okay. um, so why, uh, why have states taken such different approaches to this? Um, and what would you say to neighboring states um, that, you know, Massachusetts has been able to do? I would note that um, Rhode Island, for example, has not addressed um, vote by mail. They still have a witness requirement to vote by mail. Um, and uh, um, yet there are some other states that have um, passed sending ballots to everyone. Um, so what, what can other states learn from what we've done so far? Anything? Well, I mean, I, I, would, just, I would just add that we're all gonna learn from each other. Um, you have some states like Oregon that does all voting by mail. I think one of our concerns by doing just all voting by mail is that we, you know, we don't have the best voter rolls. We have 250,000 people that are deemed, um, you know, not basically, you know, not not active, inactive. So it is it is a little harder for us to do that. But I think we're going to learn a lot, um, and we're also going to learn how many people decide to that they want to vote by mail. Um, you know, I think the thing that really makes us different from the rest of the states is that we really chose a hybrid approach where, you know, you can vote on election day clearly, but you also can vote early and you can, you know, make, and you can come on a Saturday and Sunday. So we really went out of our way that if you don't want to do it by mail that you can show up. Um, and then, you know, this vote by mail, we'll see how many people actually, you know, fill out the application and send it back. Uh, and so, you know, this is the brave new world and we will know, you know, if this thing is effective or not. You know, what other states are, are doing, the one thing that we are not gonna do, we put in the bill, is we make it very difficult to shut down polling locations or move polling locations. Part of the problems in other states is that they're shutting down locations and they're creating such lines that people don't wanna vote. And the one thing that we're, both Chairman Law and I are committed is that 
because of COVID-19, we don't want a single voter to be disenfranchised. So that is why that we, we've taken this hybrid approach. And I, I'm hopeful that we'll learn from other states and I think other states will learn from us. So um, one, a couple of questions that were received from the audience. Um, one is, does anything about this bill and our procedures change if there's full lockdown in November? Will we still have these options? Um, what will be different, if anything? Well, I would say that if we go into full lockdown, um, then that's going to be a whole nother, you know, if, if people can't physically go out to vote, uh, and the governor says you can't go out to vote, then we're going to, then we might have to go back to the drawing board and, and potentially do something else. But I don't, I don't expect to see that. Um, even if we are in, um, shut, you know, let's shelter in place, um, you're still allowed to go to a grocery store, you can go to Home Depot. So we're going to just have people, you know, obviously socially distance themselves and, um, you know, basically um, vote. But I think if that happens, you will see a ton of people vote by mail. And once again, people will have that option. And understand that we've given people up until the Wednesday before the election. So literally that Wednesday, you could request um, to vote by mail and you'll get one. And, and even if your ballot comes in after the election day, um, you'll still be counted. So we, we've planned for a lot of different scenarios. And I, I think that no matter what where we are with the virus, I, I think we'll be, you know, have a solution. I do just uh, um, echo those comments by Senator Feingold. You know, having the, these options and the most options available is is what is going to, um, you know, give every voter in Massachusetts that opportunity. Um, so you know, I think the plans that we're all making um, in government and in with our schools and everything else, it, it's all week to week right now. Um, we don't know. I think the way things are trending here in Massachusetts, you know, it looks like September 1st primary will, will be okay as of today. It, it, you know, we're doing much better than other parts of the country. But um, again, we don't know what November 3rd looks like. Um, and there'll be time to assess that. Um, and if, yeah, if there needs to be some changes, um, I think, you know, we'll obviously look at them. I don't know what else we could do, though. I think we've covered everything that we can do. We can't uh, really do much more that, that we know of right now. And COVID-19 has obviously made us all in every business um, to healthcare examine, you know, whether it's telehealth, uh, things that were, you know, we were nervous about doing, but we're, COVID-19 has, has forced us to, to, to take these steps um, and, you know, obviously companies that are now will be rethinking how office space and, and, and that they can run a business uh, in a different way. Um, you know, our elections are gonna be looked at and how we can run them in different ways and how we can still have them be effective. So um, we will just keep, you know, an eye on this as it's, you know, every week to week, like everything else. And uh, if there's something that we can do, we, we will certainly look at that and try to do something differently, but I think, Hopefully things look good for September 1st and November 1st is November 3rd is just too far away for us to make any other changes right now. Yeah. So we got, um, thank you. Um, we have a, several questions and I'll just, I think we can answer these very quickly. Um, Senator Feingold, you already mentioned that HAVA money is available for, um, for equipment potentially. But we've had several questions basically wanting reassurance that staff time and the other expenditures that cities and towns make would be reimbursed by the state under, you know, some of the unfunded mandates law or other procedures. Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, I can't, I can't 100% guarantee, but historically, unfunded mandates like this um, have been reimbursed. Um, but it also depends how much money we get from the feds and, and if we get money from the feds. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, that's a discussion that you have to have with your local um, mayor, board of selectmen, town manager. But I think that is something that, you know, historically has been reimbursed and we're in an unusual time. But if we don't get any money from the feds and we have to, you know, cut $6 billion, 
who knows what, what, what's going to look like for reimbursement to local communities. So um, Representative Lawn and, and uh, Senator Feiler, you can add into if you want. One of the questions that we received, and you already touched on this a little bit, but I think it's worth um, a, a, a restating because as a, a number of people have asked, uh, many states and across the country send um, actual ballots to every registered voter. Uh, in Massachusetts, what constituencies were opposed to mailing everyone a ballot? Isn't that more efficient and less labor intensive? What were the concerns about it? And is there any chance we could adopt it in the future and what would need to be in place? I will certainly speak to that, I guess, first, just because I filed the bill that, um, we, that uh, was to send ballots to everyone in the general election. So what's important to, to, know, to realize is that in the primary, we've got not just a Democratic Party, a Republican Party, Libertarian, Green Party, we've got other parties, and we also have more than, of the, I think, 4.6 million registered voters are two and a half million of the registered voters unenrolled. So for a primary, they need to indicate what ballot. So we couldn't just mail ballots to everybody. And we realized that that was going to be, you know, something that just could not be done. In the general election, my bill originally filed was to send everyone a ballot. Uh, and the thought was, we're expecting anywhere from 75 to 85% turnout in the general election. And we're only, we, we're down to one ballot. So it's one ballot. Um, when we listen to the testimony, we listen to Marty Walsh speak about unregistered voters. Uh, in the city of Boston alone, it was 52,000 unregistered voters. And the thought of ballots piling up in an apartment complex or um, ballots being, you know, uh, mishandled or, or sent to people who did not request them and not verified was troubling. And it was troubling to a lot of people that uh, we need to do a much better job of cleaning up our voter information roles. We need to make sure that, uh, and I think at this point, this time in our country, we don't, that's, a, that's a, as I spoke about earlier, something that we don't need is another divisive issue. And we have a president who's talking about voter fraud and that vote by mail is voter fraud. Um, and you know, we, we, we just didn't need that. We, we felt like it was important to have somebody you know, fill out an application, verify their voter ID, make sure it's updated, and then we'd send them a, a ballot. So um, you know, those were considered, but at the end, because of the different parties in the primary, um, and then certainly we have uh, a lot of work to do before we could uh, mail ballots everybody in a general election in terms of cleaning up our voter rolls. So yes. I, would, I would just echo what, what uh, Representative Blonde said, is that it, it just, just the, the, the fact we have 250,000 inactive voters, you know, I think we have to clean up our voters list. I think we have to have better voter lists and, and, and the risk of having that many ballots potentially just out there, you know, just didn't, didn't make a lot of us comfortable. So it's an imperfect system in an imperfect year that I think we're gonna have to do the best we can. Uh, and, and I think that when you try to pass legislation that the one, that one thing that Chairman Law no, and I know is that, you know, when you do a bit, bit, bill on the environment, you know, some people have interest in it. When you do a bill on transportation, you know, some people have expertise in that. When you do a bill on election law, everyone's an expert and everyone has their own opinion. And that, you know, there's a lot of people uncomfortable with the idea of sending uh, ballots. And, and the thing that was hard about this negotiation is that, you know, not only did we have Democrats we had to try to deal with, we had Republicans as well. We had the Secretary of State we were negotiating with, and then we had the governor. Uh, so as, as we say that, you know, don't let, um, you know, good be the enemy of perfect, or perfect be the enemy perfect of good. Perfect be the enemy of good. <laughs> yeah, so long, long week as I, I tell people. So, so you know, it's, um, it's a very, very good bill. Um, it's not perfect, but I do think it's gonna, it's gonna meet what we need uh, come this fall. So one thing I would just 
put into this little piece of the discussion is that the legislature passed a bill in 2018 that would go a long way to cleaning up our voting laws. Part of it was automatic voter registration where you um, get registered unless you decline at a, at a state agency. Um, and then the second was joining a consortium of states, which is now up to 30, called the Electronic Registration Information Center. Those states pool their voter lists, they pool their, uh, their voter motor vehicle data, they rely on federal death notices and social security records to clean the lists and move people that have moved or died and uh, put on people that have uh, actually moved to our state. Uh, the secretary has not implemented that law the way it was passed by the legislature and not implemented ERIC at all. And that is something that we might be able to do in the future in order to um, be better prepared for vote by mail in the future. So that brings us to my, um, one of my last questions, which is about um, what parts of this law, you know, this it, primarily it was for 2020 only. Um, what do you see surviving and what do you see as the future for election reform here in Massachusetts? Well, I, I would say that the portal is something that is clearly going to survive, having more options to do things online. Um, I, I hope that we continue to vote early, um, primary wise. Um, and then we'll see if we need to do this for future elections as far as how much voting by mail we need to do and how much people want to do it. So, I mean, and it's, and I don't think anybody's ever ruled out, you know, doing elections by mailing ballots to people. Just, we have to get, you know, as we mentioned just previously, we have to get our, our voting rolls to another level and, and, and feel more comfortable about it. So, um, so I, I think we're going to learn a lot from this election. And I think that I'm hopeful a lot of things stay. Um, but like I said, this is, this is going to be a very interesting experiment. And I think we're going to learn a lot from it. Just to add that um, most of the other states that vote by mail, Oregon, some of the other states, they did go through their growing pains. We will certainly go through some pains this year, regardless of the options that were provided, because it's not perfect. It's, it's a challenging year. Our clerks are, um, are hardworking and they're going to do the best they can, but we're gonna have to sit down and, and look back and see what, what works, what didn't, how we can support um, our clerks and other ways to make uh, voting just more accessible um, and safe. And that will be, I think, just a, something that we will do going forward after 2020 ends and we can sit back and, and say, you know, what, what works, what didn't, and how we can improve. And I know one of the things that we're doing the, with the new electronic pads that will be um, hopefully available at the, at the, uh, polling locations with updated voter information that should should help. I think we're going to go through a lot of, um, of of growing pains here of just you know getting people used to the to different technologies, and uh, we certainly got to recruit. I think we've I think we're going to put a big emphasis on recruiting, uh, you know, more people to help out with our polls, more civic engagement in, in how important you know we've we've kind of relied on our seniors to to in so many communities as, as, as poll workers, but we need to really do a good job of, of letting people know we need help, the clerks need help, our cities and towns need your help. Um, so we can hopefully engage a younger generation to be more civic minded and, and participate in, in, in working at our polling locations. I think that is something that we really need to, um, to work on going forward. So, um... Thank you both. It's about time to wrap up. We have had a couple of more questions that I think we'll just quickly touch on. There was a question about dropping off ballots. Um, that's part of the new law. You can drop off your absentee, uh, or your moat by mail ballot in person or in drop boxes, which the legislation authorizes for the first time. So that if you have concerns about the mail, you can avoid it. Uh, and the secretary has been talking to the post office about speeding that up, but obviously that's a much bigger question than Massachusetts. Um, 
So there was one other question, which is really for me, um, then I'll answer and then we'll, we'll wrap up. And that is um, the applications were supposed to be sent by Wednesday. They were not. How will they, how will he be compelled to meet other future dates? Um, how can uh, we ensure that this kind of voting uh, access is available in future years. So just on the accountability piece, um, Common Cause, Mass Vote, and seven plaintiffs did sue to make sure that mailing got out. We were concerned when the secretary said he wasn't going to send it unless he got the money. I think all the clerks on here would, um, if they all said they weren't going to do their job, if they didn't get the money, we'd be in big trouble. Um, they have to do what the law tells us. The legislature is the group that makes the laws for our state. Um, so we'll be um, watchdogging that and ensuring we don't have problems in, in the future. Obviously, this was a complicated mailing. It was late. Uh, he obviously had to be um, preparing before the actual law was signed, and that's a difficult place to be in. Um, communication is always uh, important in these things, and when you communicate that um, something is, uh, you know, maybe a day late, nobody's going to have problems. Um, but when there's a, a, a different kind of communication about not doing your job, that's another story. So I am very um, gratified to be able to work with both of these exemplary public uh, representatives and uh, uh, advocates for voting rights. Um, Representative uh, Lawn, Chairman Lawn has, uh, as he said a couple of times, was the sponsor of our original legislation. Um, then ultimately the bill that passed incorporated virtually every one of our ideas. Uh, and um, I was very, um, it was great to participate um, bo with both of the chairmen on, in this process. And I know as we go forward, we will work to incorporate the best ideas of this year into the future. Um, are there other closing remarks that you would like to make quickly? And then I'll turn it back over to Lauren. Yeah, I, I would just say, first of all, thank to the Kennedy Institute. Thank you, Pam, for, for having us. But now it's on everyone else. So now it's, it's your turn to go out and recruit people, tell people about it, get people out to the polls. Like the, As we always say, this is the most important election ever. This is the most important election ever. So really need people to like get out there. We have a system that gives plenty of opportunity and now it's up to the, everyone else to do their thing. I just want to thank uh, Pam and the Kennedy Institute as well and, and Senator Feingold and everyone who tuned in today. Um, and I think just to, to reiterate what we talked about earlier about those options about dropping off the ballots. Um, the U.S. Postal Service is under a tremendous amount of strain as well. That amount of mail being handled by our postal carriers. So the more you, we can encourage our neighbors, our friends, our family to drop off your ballot in the secure drop box, anything you can do to relieve stress and drop it off early, um, anything we do will be a help um, to help this election go smoothly. So it's incumbent on all of us to try to assist our clerks and our cities and towns and our poll workers uh, to the best we can to try to just educate that this is, as Barry said, the most important election, like every election. And we need to support all of the foundations of voting um, so that we can make sure that uh, all, all these elections go as smoothly as possible. So just thank you everybody um, for your participation today and for your concern and for your um, engagement in, in Massachusetts and, and voting and, and making sure that uh, every vo voice in Massachusetts will be heard. Lauren? Thank you, both. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much to Pam, to Chairman Feingold and to Chairman Lawn for this very important conversation and for all of your work in preserving and expanding access to the vote in Massachusetts. Um, this is so important and we encourage everyone to share these new options as we come into September and November. Thank you also to all of our audience members who've joined us today. Um, and just to share a recording of this program will be available on the Kennedy Institute website next week. 
Please do stay tuned for updates from the Institute on future virtual programs and our upcoming digital exhibit that will share how each of us has a critical role to play in elections this fall. To stay engaged, please make sure that you are registered to vote. And also, if you haven't done so already, please fill out your census form online at 2020census.gov. Thank you for your continued support and dedication to democracy and civic engagement. And on behalf of the Kennedy Institute, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much.